Hey everyone, so now we've landed at chapter eight and chapter eight deals basically with how the, the public is influenced uh, through elections and the process that we go by electing officials. And in this chapter, you're going to learn about some of the complicated uh, scenarios that we confront every day, uh, looking at how campaigns are run, how the elections are processed and you know how the public is influenced so let's jump into this now so when we talk about the idea of how we decide who we're going to vote for right in any election or even what issues whether we're talking about climate change or uh, the affordable care for for public health option you know for health care things uh, whatever the issue is there's you know think about what how you go about deciding what you're going to vote for, right? And that's an important context about what influences you. Now, remember when you, we go back to the very first chapter and I talked about the different types of power and two of those types, one called persuasion, where they basically lay out all the information and then you can make a decision with all the available information, um, whether you're gonna vote for candidate A or candidate B or even how you feel about issues like climate change or or uh, the, even the right you know, abortion issue, right? Uh, and so with that, uh, if I give you all the information, then you can hopefully make a fairly wise decision about how you feel about it based on your own personal values, but with all the available information. The other type uh, is called, as you should remember, is called manipulation. And manipulation is when I conceal for you uh, some of the information because I'm trying to persuade you or sway your idea about the issue. So for example, if I want you to think negatively about climate change or think that it doesn't exist, I just simply eliminate most of the data that says that climate change is real. Even though 95% of the scientists on the planet uh, acknowledge that climate change is real, and uh, yet there are still people out there who don't believe it. Um, and sometimes there are even scientists who will, don't believe it, but it's a very, very small percentage. So then the question is, do you believe the person 95% of the scientists or do you believe the other people on the other side that are 5%? Uh, but that's how we go about developing our opinion. Um, as we grow, when we start out in life, most of how we feel about things is based on our families. So even for most of you, in terms of if you're you know, liberal or conservative, if you even know that answer yet, or whether you call yourself a Democrat or Republican, is usually derived from your parents. But the problem with that, and there is a problem with that possibly, and that is, see, your parents develop their ideas typically around the same time that you do, around 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, when people start to formulate their thoughts about these issues. Well, the thing is that you have to understand is that, <laughs> You know, the world was very different when they were 18, 19, or 20 years old. So being a liberal or being a Democrat in 1980 or 90, uh, or being a conservative at that same time, is not the same as being a conservative in, in 2020. So, you know, when you think about where you stand, I would say for most of you who are younger, this is probably the time you're gonna to start to develop your own ideas and hopefully, you know, in a very wise way. And they may concur with your parents, but they may not. So it's important for you to understand your place and, and your role in this process of electing officials and how we are, how the opinions that are created for you, a lot of times are reflected back to you. There's a term we use, it's called genuflection. And genuflection is basically when society creates for you what they want you to perceive about an issue that you then take in as being your own belief system. And then once you perceive it as being yours and that you didn't learn it from somewhere else, it's like they've taught you what they want you to think. That's the essence of genuflection. And so we are all basically in some way, shape or form reflections about what we have learned through society about the issues that are important or even that may not be important to us or even how we decide that they're not important. Sometimes they don't want things to be important for you. So for example, if old people are worried about young people voting, then they, then they will basically set up the process of what, for you to think that your vote doesn't count and all those kinds of things. And therefore you may not show up to vote and they win because they have made you believe that your vote doesn't count. It doesn't have to be true. They just have to get you to believe it is or, makes, or create a, a poll of some sort to make you think it's true. Uh, 
But let's move on a little bit here. Okay. Um, so in terms of, you know, the idea of public opinion, and I posted this quote from Martin Luther King because I think it's one of the most important uh, notions of uh, how we see the world. And he says, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance or conscious and conscience of stupidity. Um, and when you think about that in context, you know, it really has a lot to do with people who want to believe what they want to believe, even if they even if you know, they say, hey, the world isn't the world isn't flat, the world is round, and they somehow, you know, sincerely believe the world is flat, you know, or you say, hey, the sky is blue, and they say, no, it's green, and you may want to tell them all day that it's blue because it looks blue to us, but if it's green to them, then it's green to them, right? And so. Um, that's you know sort of sincere ignorance. You just you know when they didn't want to believe that Obama, President, former President Obama, was an American citizen. Uh, they said, oh, he's from Africa or someplace, and he doesn't have any papers. Well, <laughs> that's just it's completely stupid and ridiculous. Partially because to have the security clearance at the highest level to have access to nuclear codes, you are vetted thoroughly <laughs> through every intelligence agency on the you know in our country to before you can even run for office. So, and yet there's still people out there who still believe. Uh, that he's not from here. So, you know, it's like, you know, per perception is reality. And if somebody perceives it to be true or chooses to be consciously stupid about it, something because they just cannot handle the truth, then that's what happens, right? Uh, it's like when you have a boyfriend or girlfriend and then, you know, the, she, he or she might be cheating on you. And that's probably never happened to any of you, but in case it ever did, and you want to believe that your person, the woman, the girlfriend or boyfriend is such a great person, right? And then, uh, you know, you just choose not to believe what might be obviously in front of you, you know, until later on. Which I'm not sure that's never happened to any of you, but just in case it ever did, I'm sure it's the same context. <laughs> I hope I didn't ruin anybody's day, by the way. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so this is the context of, you know, understanding, you know, when we talk about public opinion and how we, you know, how we are basically, how we choose to process information and where we get our information from. And so much of it comes from social media these days, and that's kind of the context of where we delve into this information. And some of the, and because there's so much information available on social media, the danger is that the context of either misinformation, because I can dump all kinds of information out there to you, millions of bits of data every second that you get access to that helps form your opinion. Uh, but I can also create misinformation and disinformation where I'm dissuading you from even looking at or focusing on an issue um, simply by virtue of the information I allow to be put out there. That's why can you go back and look at the presidential race in 2016, the, the Russians' involvement in, ac in accessing our social media platforms to try and sway American consciousness was pervasive. And this is all documented. You can re research it all you want. Um, and then what they did to try and influence people to either, you know, not vote for Hillary or to support Donald Trump, or, or even sometimes even to try and support Hillary for those who wanted to go that direction. So uh, there was lots of uh, uh, manipulating of information, and they know they can do this relatively easy, easily uh, because of the access to social media. And without any basic you know, checks and balances in the social media platform, uh, you can pretty much say what you want, even if it's not true, and people will have access to it. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the ways that we create uh, and develop our, our public opinion is through polling. And it's interesting is we, we're sort of wired where, <laughs> you know, if somebody, if somebody said to you a poll that said 90% uh, of American people polled uh, believe that uh, men come from Mars. Men come from Mars. And if you heard that, most people would go, wow, 90% of people, wow, that's... That's amazing, so it must be true. So maybe I'll think that way too. Here's the catch. I could be in a room with 10 people and I count off nine of them. And nine people out of 10 say that. I could say that 90% of people polled believe this is true. Now, here's the catch. You don't know that I only polled 10 people because I don't tell you that. I just say 90% of the people that were polled believe this, right? I didn't say 330 million Americans, approximately, were polled. I just tell you that 90%. So this is what you have to be careful about when you hear about certain, when you look at polling data, which really is the driver of your belief system about the things that are relevant in your life and who, who you, whether it's who you're going to vote for, how you feel about certain things. Um, even when even when you go to buy food or you say that this is the number one hamburger in San Diego or the number one, you know, 
pizza place or whatever. You know, how do you know that? Who did they poll to ask that question? How many people did they really question when they did that? And so a lot of times we, you know, because the polls don't have to be checked and balanced <laughs> or, or checked for accuracy or in their content, um, they they basically get to get out of jail free card. But we the people, you know, when we hear those things, we respond in terms of how we decide we're going to vote on issues and, and the things that are relevant to us. So it's important that we understand the context of, of polling in the way of how polls are actually utilized. So a couple of things I'll just point out here on this particular slide. Um, you know, when they talk about different types of polls, and certainly random sampling poll is very common. This is basically where they just take polls, you know, from any any particular demographic and population. So if you want to know what people think about, you know, the issue of let's say race in America, you know, if you take a random sample poll, you would just kind of close your eyes and pick, you know, however many people from different regions of the country, and then come up with a general sample and you say that this, based on this sample size, this is how people believe about that issue, right? Um, uh, and then sample bias, this, red, this has to do with the percentage of plus or minus of a poll that is uh, represented by the population. So, for example, if they said 95% of people believe that climate change is real, they would also have plus or minus two or three points, which means it could be either as high as 98 or as low as, say, 92%, right? There's always going to be error, an error rate, and it's usually within a few percentage points of the sample bias. Um, and then we have also what we call non-response bias, and this happens again when people just decide not to participate, you know, some people don't respond to polls. Uh, so that's also part of it. Uh, there's also aspects of how we go about weighting polls when we deal with, like, when we, like, the, like the U.S. Census was just occurring, right, and how we weight our polls based on the, and the adjustments that are made during the surveys that deal with census, for example. Uh, and so uh, the other thing about sample bias, actually, it's a similar sample error, right? So the error is the percentage, but the sample bias is actually more, like, for example, if I wanted to get a, if I wanted a, a feel about, say, those who did them with the issue of, say, abortion, for example, and I wanted it to be uh, people who generally more support the right to choose rather than the right to life. Well, if I take that, if I take that sample uh, in more urban areas that are more progressive, uh, say Los Angeles, New York, Seattle, uh, Chicago. I can, you know, I can take the poll in certain places and get a certain result. If I wanted people who supported more of the ideas of anti-abortion issues, then you could take that in the South or in the Midwest and certain areas that have demographics that support that idea. But here's the catch: most of you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that there was some sample bias because you don't know where the poll is being taken. So when people uh, put polls out. You have to be very careful in understanding the context of how polls can be utilized to manipulate you uh, because of how they're taken and what, even what age demographic they take them from, right? So uh, these are things that, that are that you're usually left out of the discussion that you would have to know or should know about in, this, in the process of deciding how you feel about issues or the people you're going to vote for. Uh, there's also other things uh, that we look at as well. So like one of the things we do to try and minimize the sampling error is we use poll aggregators, uh, which are like taking averages, right, to, to see, you know, how well the poll, how accurate the polls actually are. Um, we also have to be careful what we call the house effects, which basically deal with, you know, whether there are polls are out there that favor one political party or one ideology over another. So whether they're liberal or conservative, uh, that can drive polls in terms of how they tend to be more slice, slice, slanted toward one versus the other. Uh, uh, we have, you know, digital polls that are done, you know, on, on telephone lines through computers. Uh, we have various tracking polls. We have exit polls. So there's all different types of polls out there, and they all serve different purposes. But one thing's for sure: once they reach the public, and we see that the percentage is either high or low toward the issue we, that we're interested in, people will either push harder or they'll back away and say, ah, my, "I'm not going to get anything out of this, so therefore, why should I bother?" And so we have to be very careful about that and how we let polls control us. Um, and again, who the, who the polling agencies are. Because if you hear a poll that comes from the, one of the news sources, NBC or CBS or Fox News or whatever, you have to understand that those people have their own vested interest in trying to uh, 
manipulate your mind about the issues. So, you know, Fox News, for example, is a very conservative uh, news source. And if you, you know, most people who watch it are people who want to hear people who sound just like them or believe what they believe. So if Fox News puts a poll out there, for example, people would tend to want to believe whatever it says, whether it's actually true or not. And the same with MSNBC, which tend to be more liberal. I'll, I'll play on both sides of this, that, they, you know, the polls that come out of those people would also potentially say these polls aren't accurate either because it serves a liberal purpose. So, you know, we have to do a little bit of our own homework to, to really, uh, and then look for the more reliable polling uh, organizations uh, that really do a better job of doing this than the ones that sometimes are slanted toward one group or another. Uh, so let's talk for a moment about, again, in terms of your opinion about issues. Where, does your, where do your views of these issues come from? Well, they come from a lot of different things. Um, they come from your, you know, part of your, your socialization. They call it political socialization, but it's also just your socialization about how you see the world around you, how you see the society around you, uh, your, the, your the American values, or how we the perceived visions of how we see ourselves. So we have you know, the American ego, the flag, patriotism. We have, these are all these things at you that derive, uh, that form the basis of, of your political views about how you see the world around you. Um, your political party certainly can drive that. Um, sometimes your race and that, your ethnicity can drive that. Gender certainly can play a part in that. They can look at these. And now, because of all the technology, they can look and see, like, for example, how many people who are, who are uh, women, for example, are more, you know, Democrat liberal or, or, or Republican conservatives. Um, they can look by ethnicity, race. They can look by religion. They can break down all these demographics and be able to determine whether they slant more toward being more liberal or more democratic. I mean, more liberal democratic or more conservative. So it's important to understand uh, how you are influenced by your own upbringing. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes one of the most difficult things we have to do in our lives is basically take, take in new information. Um, and one of the challenges that I would challenge all of you to do is to get, you know, get a little more uncomfortable with, with uh, just the status quo. And you know, it gets to the point in our life as we get older, we just think we know everything, right? <laughs> and frequently, we always believe that until somebody tells us otherwise, until life shows us otherwise, um, which takes time and a little more living. But uh, the idea is simply that uh, you have to be able to sort of be willing to get uncomfortable with the fact that everything you think you know now may not always be accurate or true, and that you may have to reevaluate some of the things that you think are important to you. Okay, um, but really the ultimate poll really was we the people. So the collective view of the people and rarely do we see a time when they ask all 330 million of us what we think. Uh, but, you know, our, our being able to vote, you know, and vote consciously on issues and people, not just based on the context of, uh, of recognizing uh, recognizing those individuals based on their political affiliation, uh, but also having the courage to vote for people who represent your ethics or, or values. Uh, not, what, not what people will tell you about them, but doing your homework to see exactly who they are. It's like, for example, and I'm just gonna go back and talk about 2016 election for a quick second. And yet, and they, people just blasted Hillary, you know, and they'd be, even women, you know, because they said they blamed her and said that she was a supporter of abortion. And I was like, and, and you know, I mean, she and that's not true at all. What she supported was a woman's right to choose. Um, and she basically had said that, well, you know, I don't think that I have a right to tell you what to do. That's between you and your doctor, your family, and God, or, you know, but not, not, not to be legislated politically. Um, but the way that it was put out publicly to the public and people responded, but then people didn't vote for her, a lot of them, because they felt like she was like, not this religious person, uh, which wasn't true. But unfortunately, again, it's all a political game. And that's it. She lost because of that. <laughs> um, for a lot of reasons, there were other reasons she lost too, but that was certainly was one of them. Um, also, you know, there are also barriers that we face, particularly in certain demographics, to how they go about regulating the electorate, particularly by uh, voter ID laws. I mean, they can keep people away from the polls by trying to block them. And so, for example, for years they kept blocks and black folks out of the polls uh, because of having poll taxes and having a, 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 where they actually had to uh, have literacy tests, things like that, to, before they could vote. Uh, they would ask some questions like, you know, recite the Constitution. 
you know, things that they, uh, there's no way that anyone could ever do, but, but that's what they would do to try and keep black folks from moving in the South, you know, in the, in the elections. Uh, and fear of death as well, too. But this was also the case for Hispanics and certainly for Asians as well. So if they, and now, like, for example, in Texas, in the last election, over 600,000 people, mostly Hispanic, were not allowed to vote uh, in the last election because of voter ID laws in Texas. Now, no one's saying that you shouldn't have some form, some form of identification, but but the laws there are real restrictive. And so it will allow for 600,000 people to not have their votes heard um, in the last uh, election. Um, and then, you know, it's interesting how, you know, people will, you know, the context of people understanding, like when people say, well, you know, my vote doesn't matter and why should I vote? And, uh, you know, most elections we find that, you know, in a presidential race, less than half the people vote that are eligible to vote. Uh, and then in like in the midterm, in the off the, the off years, that literally about 20 to 25 percent of the people, sometimes as high as 30 percent will vote. And that's usually for Congress or your other races like that. Um, so it's a problem when, when, because then you're not having the collective will of the people. And that's why we talk about leaving the electoral college and joining with the popular vote, meaning one person, one vote. Um, I'd be curious to know what you think about that. And I may pose that to, as a question for you to just answer uh, whether we think the popular vote should stand or whether you think the electoral college should stay the way it is, which I'll be explaining in a moment. Okay, um, let me explain to you a little bit about, and I'm using the example of the presidential race, sort of how it happens. Okay, so let me set this up for you. And you can see um, in this particular chart, or, or not chart, but on this slide, that uh, during the process, there, there's usually a cycle for the presidential race. And it usually starts about a year before, or at least it used to. Now it's probably more like two years. They start discussing the possibilities of you know, who's running and all these types of things. But usually the last year, from November of, of 2019, let's say, to November of 2020, would be the presidential election cycle, we call it. And during this time, you know, those people who are interested in running for office, they have what's called the invisible primary. And basically what happens is the, the people who are interested in possibly running will, you know, talk to their friends, um, see if they've got any economic interests and in many people who can financially back them. If people like their ideas. So they call it like a testing of the waters. They kind of dip their toe in the water of the presidential race and say, hey, I'm interested in running. What do you think? And either the people go, yeah, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Or, you know, heck no, man, you suck. I'm not even thinking about it, right? <laughs> so, so it could go either way for you. But certainly at the very beginning of the election cycle, there are many people who throw their names out there. And then they wait to see if there's any interest. Um, and that usually happens again about a year or so uh, before the election. Uh, and then it's in step two, you get to the, what we call the nomination period. And this is basically when the political parties, each, both political parties have their primaries. And this is basically for them to get to the, to the point where they're going to decide uh, through the primaries, who is going to be their elector, their person who's going to vote for the president. So the Democrats will have their primaries, Republicans have their primaries for every state in the union. And then they will select, we'll see who wins the most primaries. And that's usually the person who's going to be there's the person who's selected to run for office for the uh, president. Um, then, of course, they have the party caucuses, which is when the local political parties of uh, the Democrats, Republicans get together in their conventions to get their delegates situated. Um, most of the party caucuses are in the, in the scheduling of the primaries are set up early. In the early, the nice thing about the early season of the primaries, and they, next, this year they changed quite a bit. They had a lot of early primaries. For, for states that normally have it later. And they did this because what it does is if a candidate starts to gain momentum during the primary season, then they, that individual can kind of push themselves further into the possibility of being the president, like being in the presidential race or finalist, I should say. So it's important where they do those primaries and which states they do them in. You know, the more conservative states, of course, have their results, and the more liberal states, of course, have their results. Uh, and so, you know, and throughout that period, there may be many times where the, where the person who is what we call the front runner, the person who looks like they're more likely to win get their nomination from their party, it can change throughout that cycle. So it could be one time it could be the Democrats, one time it could be the Republicans. It all varies from point to point. Um, yes, they can gain momentum. So when you front load uh, the schedule with primaries that support one candidate or the other, then 
as the good person builds momentum, then what happens is those people who are interested in some of the other candidates might shift their allegiance because they see they realize that their political party uh, can't win or isn't going to win, or that one should see their party, but that individual that they're going to vote for is, uh, is not going to win. So that may lead them to change their who they think was the best candidate based on who's likely to, to get the nomination. Um, and so, for example, just to give you a quick example, so Joe Biden is the, is the Democrat uh, person who's up for election. And, uh, but throughout the primary season, it shifted from many different people, from Kamala Harris to, to Elizabeth Warren to Buttigieg to, I mean, it just bounced around from point to point. So uh, and many people didn't think Biden was even doing well, but then at the 11th hour, he picked up speed and then he built momentum and that led him right into where he is now as the Democratic nominee for the presidency. Um, and then what this all happens during cycles. So again, uh, step two usually happens in the spring of the year. And then by the summer, they have the nom national nominating conventions, which usually happen sometime in the summer period between June and usually late July at the latest as a rule. Of course, this year with coronavirus, it's a little more complicated, so uh, it's going to look a lot different than it ever has in modern history. But this is basically where the political parties get together in their own entities. The Republicans have their national convention, and so do the Democrats, and then they will basically gather with their candidates. The presidential and the vice presidential candidates are there, and they basically get their party. It's like a coming out, if you would, right, uh, for the political candidates who are then going to prepare for the next few months to, to get themselves ready to run for president. And then they'll have a series of debates and things like that and then have the election. Um, once November comes, and it's always in November when we elect the president, he doesn't, the individual doesn't take office till January 20th, uh, uh, or actually the 21st, actually, but the, 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 the inauguration is on January 20th, and then the day after is when the, when the president takes, takes over. So you're elected in November, and, and then in is a transition period from the beginning of November till the middle of January, or toward the end of January, and then we uh, then we'll have our new president. If that happens this year, we'll see. Um, again, the electoral college is the entity that that elects the president, um, and it's interesting because people think because we have this electoral college process, uh, which is based on the number of legislators we have from state to state, uh, that their individual vote doesn't count. And I tell them all the time, this is absolutely not true. Your vote absolutely does count because here's how it works. And in fact, I'll, let me step forward here a little bit. I'll like uh, explain this to you. But also explain the context of swing states, those states that basically are undecided. They could go either Democrat or Republican. Um, and let me show you on this electoral college map. And this is the last part of this, of this uh, chapter. So let me get to it. As you can see on this map of the United States that uh, every state has a number in it, right? And that number represents the number of electoral college votes or electors in that state. And usually it's broken down by district. So California has 55 districts. That's why you have 55 electoral college votes. And we have a huge population. Of people. And so you need 270 votes to win, electoral college votes to win. And why they picked an even number, I have no idea. It's kind of dumb. They should have picked an odd number because there are situations where it could end up in a tie. But nonetheless, they picked an even number, and uh, no one's ever bothered to change it. Um, but what happens is both the Democrats and Republicans drop this map. And there are certain states that are sort of historically or traditionally Democrat, which are the blue states, and the red states are typically Republican. Now, um, the reason I say that your vote actually counts more than you realize, because in 48 of the states, it is what we call a winner-take-all scenario. So if you have, when you go to do your vote, Right. When you go to vote for the president of the United States, the number of popular votes, meaning your individual vote, they count them all up. And if, let's say in California, which is the Democratic stronghold, and if you, if the, if the other candidate had one more vote, meaning one more individual popular vote of the millions of people in California, then they get all 55 electoral college votes. So it's not proportional. It's it's based on the idea of you know it's a winner take all. So you have some states that are as you can see Washington, Oregon, California, along with the Northeast that are very very blue, dark blue as you can see. Then you see the little bit lighter blue, meaning they're Democrats, but they're they also do have some conservative elements that are that are that are somewhat strong. 
And then you see some states on the Republican side, you see across the Midwest and the South that mostly very strongly have been historically uh, Republican, even though, and then now some of the pinkish looking states that used to be very red are now becoming more moderate, uh, which is, you know, means that they're getting closer to sort of the beige looking states, which used to be very red, uh, especially North Carolina and Arizona, that now have the possibility of going other directions. So the goal is to get to 270. Um, so what they each do, they count up the ones that they can guarantee are going to be are going to be ones one way or the other, and then they go back and decide. Okay, once I add up the numbers that are all that I know are going to be say the dark blue or blue, and then the ones that are going to be red, then I can decide from there which ones I need to win in order to get to 270. And then what will happen is the candidates will spend all their time in those states where they need to get the extra numbers in order to win. And that's typically how that works. And then there are two states that, uh, that we call proportional, uh, Maine and Nebraska. And in both of those states, if you get, you can see where Nebraska has five electoral college votes, where if one candidate gets 50%, the other one gets 50%, well, 50, well, say 49 and 51%, that means one gets three votes, the other one gets two votes. Well, that's probably more fair. And that would probably get more people to turn out to vote because, for example, if you were a Democrat or a liberal in one of those very red states, you know, then the question is, why would you bother to vote if you saw that basically that would be a scenario where maybe your vote doesn't matter because they take all of your votes and they dump them with the other person. And just like in the, in the very dark blue states, the same thing happens to the Republicans in those states. It's like, well, why would you vote? Because basically you're losing, you're basically losing every time around. So perhaps this is impeding people wanting to vote because they realize their vote doesn't count. Uh, well, that's how, or maybe why they feel like it doesn't count, I should say. But remember, I said though, that in, the, the, you know, in order to drive the electoral college vote, it's a winner take all thing. So if you have one more vote than the other person, you get all of them in 48 states. So it is an important aspect, and you should remember that. So the electoral college absolutely does matter in the presidential race for who wins and who doesn't win. Okay. Um, I went a lot longer than I thought I would. This is going to be a short chapter, but uh, I wanted you to understand the context. So make sure you vote in November and make sure you vote consciously. You know, do your homework, have the courage to look at the candidates and look at who, what they are and not what you think they are. And make your own decisions about what you decide what it's going to look like. What I think it's going to look like for the next four to eight years. All right? All right, you guys. See you in chapter nine.